I'm just going to talk a little bit about this big thing that's happening. It's called the future internet. The internet's been through three kind of waves of development. The first was commercialising the internet at all. And when we got up in 1988 and started talking about that in Manchester, people thought we were pretty crazy. And we even had some top flight consultants tell us there'd be no commercial access to the internet for at least 10 years, 1988. Luckily, we didn't believe them. And Manchester became one of the biggest hubs outside of London in the country for little tiny companies and innovators and entrepreneurs and not for profit groups doing things with the first wave of the internet. Some, I can remember back in 1988, hand building modems and shoe boxes, which were so slow that the typing wouldn't even appear on the screen as you typed. You had to wait for it to catch up with you. Then we got broadband in, um, in the late 90s, and we had the whole dot-com boom and bust. And what we're just about to come into is a whole new era. And that's what I want to talk about. Because we've been talking about it in terms of uh, smart cities. And I want to talk a little about that, and particularly because we've got a European project called Smart Citizens in Smart Cities with colleagues who are trying to do incredibly similar things in Ghent in Belgium, in Cologne in Germany, in Bologna uh, in Italy, and in Ulu in northern Finland. And they're way ahead of us on some things, but way behind us and they're keen to catch up on things like community reporters and things like that. And so together we're sharing right across Europe some of these ideas that this future internet should not be determined by the big corporations who think they own it, but by the people who use it, by the people who want to use it, by the potential users of it. That should be the way we go forward. And at the end of this two years, in two years' time, we're actually going to be bringing uh, over to Manchester community representatives from the other four cities to meet together and spend a couple of days in Manchester looking at what we've all achieved working together in that period. So, smart cities, utterly meaningless term, basically. Um, if you go to Edinburgh, there's a smart city backpackers hospital. Um, if you go uh, to a place in the States, you'll see a lot of smart cities healthy kids initiatives, which are health based. If you go to Kansas, you'll see that the local Congress Centre advertises itself as, you know, bring your conference in because we're a smart city. So it's absolutely meaningless at one level, but very important at another. Uh, just by uh, googling at random, came across this brilliant article that you must look at, a really obscure US internet magazine called Fast Company. Uh, it's called The Battle for Control of Smart Cities. And what it tries to map out is what could 2020 look like if the people really got control of this future internet thing. Because the danger otherwise, and this is what this article is about, is that the big corporations will provide smart city in a box. And it's almost like the internet equivalent of GM food. Once you've paid the license, the only development of it is by paying another license. And once you pay those two licenses, they can sell. You know, that's the future. Whereas what they describe, if you know anything about community organising in the States, you might know a person called Jane Jacobs, who in the 60s, one of the first community organisers uh, in um, uh, uh, New York, campaigning against the demolition of working class neighbourhoods to put roads and motorways through. And it's harking back to that and saying, the future is either about Jane Jacobs inspired activists, or it's about handing over the keys to all your data, all your privacy, to people perhaps you wouldn't rather hang over to. So, so that, in other words, smart cities are important and it's becoming a really contested debate and we ought to be all taking part in it. So what is this future? I'm not going to go through all these slides, but what I will say, the word open is the thing we're concentrating. It's about open access. It's about can you go out and get internet at home from your mate's company up the road? Or do you have to go to BT? Can you actually decide when you're looking for a job, you're going to set up an internet company and provide internet access to your mates? Well, no, this is very difficult because there aren't open access networks. So in Manchester, we want to really test and trial open access networks. What about open content, what Gary's been describing? Open data. Uh, when you have a smart meter put in your house, it might help you save a bit of energy. 
But if you're just simply giving your data to the electricity company and then asking permission to access that data through their website, maybe it's not quite so helpful. Why shouldn't it be your data and you have a little open source project that gives you a little personal dashboard where you can anonymise your data and compare you know, who's got the um, most energy efficient house in the street and so on, and then you allow the electricity company, in return for a nice discount please, to have a share of your data, not allowing them. So there's a whole thing about open data <coughs> uh, content. And also, going back to Gary's point, social capital giving people the capacity and the confidence to actually run the services themselves. It's happening, for example, in the social care area very much, where care groups of carers, even carer cooperatives, are saying, we just don't want to be carers, we actually do want to control the provision. We don't want to just have a say in designing it, we actually want to deliver it. And even more, we'll set up through our little cooperative a way that you pay us a proportion of that budget directly to us as carers who know what's going on. Now, if you can facilitate that with internet, if you can get where people want it in their home, uh, remote uh, diagnostics for heart conditions, uh, uh, video on demand where if they want to do anything, they just go up and there's a, 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 an iPad type screen with their son or daughter's face on it, and then when they touch it, it makes a call or to, or to their care or whatever, you can be really begin to see why the internet then enables the co-production of services by people and these new business models. I mean, we are the home of the co-op. When we used to, Gary and I used to talk about potential digital co-op models a few years ago, we'd go down to one and they'd say, oh, co-ops, they're just for socialists and farmers. Now, don't come on, it's this co-op thing. Well, they're not. The most successful co-ops in, in this country are energy producing co-ops, of the new ones. The most successful co-op in the whole country is Oxfordshire and Berkshire. It's not Manchester or Leeds. So I think the time has come when we can be able to pose these new mutual ownership models for this future internet. And for us, in Manchester, we've got the opportunity in the first place in the UK, I'm afraid some of my European colleagues fall about laughing, because if you're in Stockholm, you can get a fibre to your house or apartment, which gives you 100 megabits, which is going to be techie for a little bit money, a minute, but you know, 10 to 50 times as fast as most internet connections you might have at home, guess how much it costs? £7.50 a month. Here, you can get that. Any little business can get that. It's 750 quid to put it in and 750 quid a month to run it. So why can they have that and we can't? So we're going to try and rectify that by developing our own co-ownership fibre network and then do some really whizzy wireless. Uh, not, not a lot of people know this, but we have a secret wireless antenna, not secret from my employers, in the tower of the town hall that can transmit up to 30 meg wireless connectivity to the internet up to 15 miles away. So we've actually driven out in one of the council vans and sat on top of Rivington car park holding a dish like this and we can get what, about 15 megabit connectivity. So we're starting off because, of course, we're not allowed to distort the market in room 112. For every place there where there are public events, we're going to put free Wi-Fi. We've done it in 10 locations across the city, including the most popular one, which is the new high-rise residence of Mr. and Mrs. Peregrine Falcon. And as from next week, you'll be able to see HD images broadcast through the RSPD website um, of that happening live in the city. Other places where there are festivals where they eventually get free Wi-Fi, and actually costs more for us to turn it off afterwards than just to leave it on. So we want to build this whole network of free wireless zones and then ask people, what can you do with this other than just watch the festival or get free wireless? So it's involving people. And, and we're then going to spread that because we're going to build this out along the new metric lines. Initially out to Sport City and the Shark Project, but right across into Oldham and Rochdale and Tameside and Trafford and eventually across the whole of Great Manchester. Some great opportunities to do new stuff. But I just want to mention another community group, the Geek Community. The Geek Community is something that uh, provides a great deal of input into uh, what uh, uh, an American writer called Richard Florida calls talent, technology and tolerance, the three T's which drive a city that's capable of having this kind of future perspective. Uh, we support the Manchester Digital Laboratory Mad Lab in the northern <coughs> quarter where people get together and they hack software and hardware, they develop ideas 
for using open data, open data uh, apps, and some of the people there will be the future internet uh, pioneers and entrepreneurs in the future. But they need support. And you can imagine when they go along with their idea to the retired bank manager, to my best friends and all that, I think against them personally, the retired bank manager at the business support group, and say, I'm a hacktivist and I've got this great idea for an open data app and I'm going to want to set up a little business, they don't quite get so much support. And that's what we've got to change. We've got to change that mentality that a lot of ordinary people working out of back bedrooms and tiny studios in places like Northern Quarter could be the next generation of internet, of internet entrepreneurs and they should be given just as much support as anyone else setting up in business. So we've even got a manifesto, again I'm not going to read uh, through it, but what the two key things about the future internet is at the moment the internet is something very much to do with IT and computers and so on, it's a little bit more to do with media. The future internet is also about things and therefore it's about things, it's about services. So it means that every bicycle could be an internet bicycle, a little tiny chip, and that would be everything from with a little sensor and like monitoring air pollution as you go and feeding that data back live into um, open data analytics which give us an opportunity to look what's happening in terms of pollution in the city. It can also mean your bike is rather more secure than it is at the moment because if it's nicked you should be able to pinpoint it pretty easily because some of these chips are now so small very unlikely to be nicking your bike would automatically know uh, uh, where it was. So imagine every bike, every single bike connected to the internet. So whether you want to track it, whether you want to do some environmental analysis, whether you just want to use you know, the Wi-Fi app on your smartphone through your bike, imagine the change that's going to bring, where everything, <coughs> sorry, everyone, everything and everywhere is interconnected through the internet. So the internet of things means the internet of services and most importantly it's the internet of people. Uh, and that future <coughs> has to be <coughs> It's absolutely no good us just thinking we can be slightly more connected consumers. We can't be. If we just stay as consumers of all, of all this, the only people who will di dictate it will be the people who want to make the most money out of it. So it needs to be a public agenda people like me who work in the public sector, it needs to be an agenda for us, but it also needs to be a community agenda. So people who are active in their communities, whether that's a thematic community, uh, um, so you're doing some work on local history, or your local archaeological group, or your campaigning group, or you represent a geography, the future internet is as important to you because there is a chance of you helping to shape it. And that's what, why uh, it was so good to accept an invite come and talk to you today and I think Mosey will be one of the places because Mosey will be uh, one of the first places uh, we, we're, we're initially connecting our cultural institutions so at the moment uh, we've got uh, Contact, Corner House, Majesty Museum and the Whitworth Art Gallery being connected with the Free Wi-Fi Network. Mosey will come very soon and we want every public space whether it's cultural, artistic, meeting areas, open space to be connected so that people can not only get access but think very differently about this new future internet, the great third wave. So thank you very much. <laughs>